me da pena que me toca en inglés. Muy raro de teclas en inglés acá, pero no. Ellos están acostumbrados. Ok, yes. So, eh, ah, pero una pregunta. Eh, yo les dije que vieran el video de la clase, pero se les dije apenas a, esta mañana. ¿Alguien lo alcanzó a ver o no? Sí, la noche sí, yo también. ¿De cuál clase? ¿La que dice la del mío? ¿La Sí. Ah, bueno. Ok. So, we are going to talk about faces of polytools. Faces that we, we understand what faces mean for a, for a polygon. The faces are just the, the vertices, the edges, the polygon itself. In a three dimensions, we understand what that means also. But I want to talk about how to define faces of polytopes in, a, in any dimension. Okay. So how do you how do you define the face of a polytope? What you're going what you're going to do is you're going to maybe maybe I will start uh, just by. I'm drawing a picture of what I want to see. So this is a picture of this room. We want to talk about what the faces of this room are. Okay. So for example, the ceiling is a face, right? And how do we describe this face? Well, we can just point to it and say that's that's the ceiling. And so. If I choose a direction to point my finger and I say what's the face in that direction, then I look for the points of the polytope that are farthest in that direction. And the polytopes that are farthest in that direction are so that's the corresponding face. Um, but you see now if, 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 I, if I miss a little bit and if I point maybe off to the side a little bit, a little bit hard to draw this, but if, if let's say that it, instead of pointing straight vertically, I just kind of rotate along this vertical plane, but a little bit in this direction. So I get a vector like this. And what are the what are the points of this polytope that are farthest in this direction? It's no longer all the green stuff. It's it's this edge right here. These are these are the points that are farthest according to this direction. And if I now, instead of pointing, I point it in this direction. Mm -hmm. So now if instead I point a little bit more in this direction, then the, the unique farthest point is going to be this vertex of the room. So if I point now, it's hard to make this look three-dimensional, but if I point a little bit more further in, then I'm going to be pointing towards this vertex. And you will see that if you point at a direction at random, generally it's going to be a unique vertex that you're pointing to. Okay? If, you have, if you're pointing to the ceiling, there's a lot of rigidity. You have to get the direction exactly right. Mm -hmm. and most of the time you're not going to get it right. So most of the time you're going to point, point to a vertex, but sometimes you're going to point to a higher dimensional thing. And that's the, that's the intuition of what I'm going to talk about. So, to specify a face of the polytope, what I'm going to do is specify where to point my finger. And there's going to be a vector C, and R to the D, that's going to specify my face. So I'm going to say that the face of D in direction C is and I denote it 
by p sub c is going to be the set of points of the polytope such that um, they are farthest in that direction. Okay. And if you think about what that means, what we're really saying is that you're taking the dot, the dot product with that with that direction. You ignore everything in that, all the other directions, so you just care about this direction. So you take the dot product with this vector, and this should be mass. Okay. A, a little technical detail that I should point out here is that our, our polytopes are closed, and because they are closed, then that maximum is actually attained. Okay, so that's the definition of the phase of key in direction C. And when I talk about a phase, I basically mean that there exists a direction such that it's, it's described in this way. Okay, and so now let me say that note that because P is bounded, right, because it's a polytope. So, um, let's say that C dot X less than or equal to C zero is the smallest inequality for D. When I say smallest, I mean that this guy should be the smallest possible. Okay. The way that you, that you should be thinking about this then is that, for example, uh, when I pointed to uh, this red guy, then there is the inequality c dot x less than or equal to whatever is attained at this point. So what I'm doing, if I look at the, at the hyperplanes c dot x equals something, there are the hyperplanes orthogonal to the red thing. Okay. And so what I'm doing is kind of taking a hyperplane like this and just bringing it in until it hits the point. So this is the hyperplane c dot x equals c0. And all the polytopes satisfy the inequality left and right to that. So then, what I want to say is that P sub C, I can also write as a set of points in P such that C dot X equals C. Okay. So good so far? Okay. So I want to talk about uh, the dimension of these things now. <laughs> well, <anything was. laughs> um, well, so let me, let me just go back and say, how do we how do we talk about dimension? And that's that's the next thing that I want to discuss. Um, let's see do this. we have in mind, now let's talk about dimension. So the thing is that you, you know what dimension means, but generally you have talked probably about dimension in linear algebra. And this is not exactly linear algebra, because in linear algebra we tend to study um, subspaces, and what we have are not exactly subspaces, they're what we call affine subspaces. So they're like subspaces, except that they don't have to go to the origin. You know that uh, any vector space has to contain zero, and our planes don't contain zero, so let me just Make some small, some quick remarks 
on outline spaces. So an outline space of RD, an outline subspace of RD uh, is there's, there's several ways of describing it. So we can just describe it by linear equations, right? So we can just say it's a solution to a system of linear equations. We can also say that it's a translate of an actual subspace. The point is that vector subspaces go through the origin, so you just move it away from the origin. And the other thing that I could, the, the other way that, that I could define this in is by talking about the affine span of some set. So I'm, I'm defining affine subspace, and, and maybe this is the word that I said a little bit about this, but to just make sure this is very clear. So when I talk about the affine spine of B, what I want to consider is the linear combinations um, the linear combinations where the VIs are in B. Uh, but the important thing is that the lambda should add up to 1. And really this, this, if you think about it a little bit, you see that what this corresponds to is that we have three points in R3, then the affine span is just looking at the, at the space, at the affine subspace that goes through those points. That's the affine span, but not, not just that. Right? It continues. The whole, the whole plane. Okay. And let me talk about uh, affine independence. So we say that a set, let's say, the one up to the k is affinely independent. kind of the same as linear independence, just when you switch the word affine for link. If no, so let's, let's call this set U. If no VI is an affine combination of the other guys, U minus V. Okay. And when I say, when I say affine combination, what I mean is something like a linear combination where the coefficients add up to one. Okay. And then the dimension for these guys is basically talking about the dimen the largest affine independent set. So the dimension of U is the size of the largest affine independent subset. Is that it? If you, if you think about it, that's not quite right because here, for example, we have um, So for example, here's, here's uh, space of dimension 2, and we have three FNA independent points. So really what I should do is take this minus 1. And that's the dimension of an affine space. Well, of course, it's just the same. I mean, another way of saying it is just move that affine space to the origin, and then you use the usual definition of dimension. This is, this is nothing new, but I want you to get used to these affine combinations. And maybe one thing that I would like to point out is that v1 up to vk 
are uh, highly independent. If and only if the vector is where you put a one on top. Linearly independent. And that just follows from the definition. Um, so it's not that affine independence is a, is a very different concept, but, but we're going to be using it a lot. So we'll just get used to that. Any questions about it? So let's talk about dimension then. The, the dimension of a phase of a phase F of P is just the dimension of the affine space. It's, it's what you used, okay? And uh, as you know, we have special names for faces uh, of dimension zero. They're called vertices. Faces of dimension one are called edges. And I'm going to need your help here, I think. Faces uh, of co-dimension one. So these are these are the faces of dimension one less than dimension of the polytope. These were called the facets. We, we talked about this in, in combinatorial community algebra. And what did I say we got? Uh, I don't know that there is a, a word that everybody agrees on. I've heard facetas and I don't like it, but I, don't, I can't think of anything there. Caretas? <laughs> 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 And then, uh, faces of co-dimension 2 are called ridges. And I don't know if you guys know what that word means in, in English, but it's kind of, it's, it's actually a pretty descriptive name. It's, it's in a mountain when, when there's like, a mountain comes together and then there's a line along the top of the mountain. Like a level set. So this is the polytope, and this is called a ridge. Is there a word for that in Spanish? I was thinking and I can't think of it. Cresta. Cresta? Oh, si, sí, cresta. Mm -hmm. Crestas y caretas. <laughs> um, anyway, so th these are some, some special faces that we pay more attention to. We like them. Now, let me make another de definition that the F vector of Polytope, the polytope P is um, just telling you how many dimensions, how many faces you have in each dimension. Here, Fi is the number of, we call them I faces. These are the faces of dimension I of. Okay. And then I define the F polynomial to be just a polynomial with quotations around these numbers. And I should, I should warn you that in different books, there's different definitions. What's going to be most convenient for us is just to forget the F minus 1. By the way, what is F minus 1? The empty. The, the empty set is, is the, the phase of dimension minus 1. Think about that for a second to see why that makes sense. But we, we say that the, the empty set is a phase of every polytope. And it's the only one, and we, it's decreed to have dimension minus one. It's a convention. There's nothing, nothing deep to say about this. 
but that means that this is always one because every polytope has the empty phase. But so since f minus one is not very important, and let's just make a, poly a polynomial of the rest. Okay, so zero x to the zero up to f d f to the d, and this is denoted by f sub p of x. Okay. Um, so, for example, if we have a an octahedron, does that look like an octahedron? I can't see if these pictures are good. Um, then what is the F polynomial? So we just have to say, how many vertices does this guy have? Just count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's dimension 0. How many edges does it have? 12. How many two-dimensional pixels does it have? 8. How many three-dimensional faces? That's another another thing that's important to notice is that the polytope is a face of itself. And it's the only face of full dimension. So in a sense, this is always one also, but so that's the F polynomial. Okay. Just keeps track of how many faces we have in each dimension. But again, I, I actually want to give you a serious warning sign here. Warning sign. <laughs> and Others, other authors use different conventions, and that includes Ziegler, actually. So the book that we're following defines this a little bit differently by just changing the order of the coefficients. So for Ziegler, the polynomial of this would be 1 plus 8x plus 12x squared plus 6x cubed. It's nothing very important, but I think this is more intuitive and it's more useful for our purposes. We have slightly different conventions. Okay? Any questions so far? So far this is not hard because it's kind of talking about what we are used to in three dimensions. And what I want us to do now is, is maybe this is the first time that you do this, let's actually uh, compute Faces and f polynomials for a real polytope in a lot of dimensions, in any dimension. So we're going to do it for the cube. So this we said in the convex hall of all vectors of the form. vectors of length d that have coordinates equal to minus 1 or 1. Okay. And, uh, so that's the d description and the f description is that these are the things whose coordinates are between minus 1 and 1. So this is c3. So what I want to do is compute all the faces of this guy. Okay. And this is something that we very often want to do for other polytopes, and in particular,
B and figure out what phase is it describing. And do this for all the possible vectors and you will have to describe all the possible phases. So let's compute Computer. This, this pixel vector B, and we compute the maximum phase in that direction. Okay. So what is that? This is given by points in my cube, okay. and uh, I can just use this expression and say until the points in the interval minus 1 to 1 to the dth power, such that v1x1 plus vdxd is maximum. What do you need to know about V to answer this question? This is, this is how, how it goes. So then you would say, well, you know, for example, let's look at V1x1. One, one. Okay. I get to choose X1 to be any number between minus 1 and 1. What should I choose it to be? So that this is as large as possible. It depends on the sign. It depends on the, depends on the sign of V1. Okay. If V1 is positive, then to make this very large, you want to X1 to be 1. But if V1 is negative, then what you want actually is to make it uh, as negative as possible. In other words, uh, you would choose it to be minus 1. Okay? So that's what we would do. So if V1 is positive, or let's say VI is positive, then what we would want to do is choose XI to be 1. If the i is negative, then we would choose x i to be minus one, so that we get minus v i. And I should say here I would choose x i equals one. Here I would choose x i equals minus one. And my third case is if the i is zero, then what, I ch what should I choose x i to be? It doesn't matter. So, what this means is that I'm going to say that B looks like some positive number and some negative number, zero and positive, zero and zero, and some negative number. Then the points in the maximal phase are which ones? They are the ones of the form. This is greater than zero, so I should choose this coordinate to be a one. This is less than zero, I should choose this to be minus one. This is zero, so I don't care what coordinate that is. This is bigger than zero, so I should choose one. Here I can choose anything. Here I can choose anything. And here I can choose minus one. Where these asterisks are anything between minus 1 and 1. And so this is the phase, the maximum phase in direction B. Okay. And uh, from this you see that, w what I was telling you, that depending on, on what B looks like, the answer is going to be different. But now we see how the answer depends on the question. If you want to know the answer, what is C, D sub V, all you need to know is what are the signs of B and then you will know what phase we're talking about. Okay. So, uh, in other words, let me, let me say something else here. Um, so I should say, this is between minus one and one, and this one also, and this one also. Okay. So what does this polytope look like? Q 
cube in the polytope. I'm sorry? A cube in three dimensions. It's a three dimensional cube that happens to live in seven dimensions, mm -hmm. but it's really three dimensional, right? The first coordinate is fixed, the second coordinate is fixed, all the other coordinates are fixed, and the three coordinates that are actually changing, they just vary like a three dimensional cube. You just get to choose each one to be between minus one and one. So this is exactly isomorphic to the three dimensional cube. So this is something useful to know, that the faces of a cube are all cubes. And that kind of matches our intuition. The faces of a three-dimensional cube are either the cube, a square, a segment, or a vertex. And that's true in any dimension. OK, so what have we basically proved here? What we have proved here is that the faces of the cube are in bijection with the sign patterns of a vector of like P. In other words, for each coordinate you just choose if it's positive, negative, or zero. For every sign pattern, I have a face. For every face, I have a sign pattern. It's a bijection. Now, let me ask you something. What is what is the dimension of a face? In terms of the sign pattern, the number of zeros. The number of zeros, right? It's the number of variables that you that you have freedom number of zeros. Okay. This is a statement that I think is intuitively clear. In the example we see it, it would require a proof, right? You, you actually have to say what does dimension mean? You know, affinely independent, blah blah blah. You would prove it, but it's but it's not difficult. You can do it. So the dimension of a face is equal to the number of zeros. So that means that what is the number of K-dimensional faces of a cube. Basically, there should be K K zeros. Out of the out of the D signs, K of them should be zeros, and I should choose which ones of those are zeros. So this is D choose K. And this basically says choose the positions of the zeros. And for the other positions, I should choose if they're a plus or a minus. Okay. There's d minus k other positions, two possibilities for each one. So I get 2 to the d minus k. And this says are other positions plus or minus. And that means that that's, that's the f vector of the d-dimensional cube. We can actually compute it explicitly. I should warn you, this is a very rare occurrence to have a polytope where you can actually compute explicitly the number of faces you can imagine. Polytopes get very complicated. Somehow this is the simplest one and, it, and so it's, it's maybe to be expected that we have a simple answer. What about the f polynomial? The f polynomial is the sum of k x to the k, k from 0 to d, so this is the sum from k equals 0 to d of d choose k, 2 to the d minus k, x to the k. This is kind of a dream come true that it actually looks like this. It couldn't have looked better for us because this is exactly the binomial theorem that tells us that this is x plus 2 yeah. to the d. Beautiful f polynomial. And this begins to explain to you why I like my choice of f polynomial. <laughs> this is one of several instances where if you, if you choose this, this definition, then the f polynomial just looks beautiful and clean, has nice properties. 
So there you go. That's maybe your, your first computation of a net vector and a, and a net polynomial. And you'll have more to do in, uh, in the homework. Did anybody see a Gimpio Kyo Yeah. Well, when there's a cousin, you have a Okay, so. Cool. That's faces. Any, any questions about this computation? By the way, as, as mathematicians, you guys are aware that if the answer is very simple, there better be a good reason for that. If we do all of this stuff and the answer comes out like this, my feeling is I haven't really understood this yet, if through these computational coincidences I get this answer. And I have to work a little bit harder to understand it. And that's what you do with the homework. I think once you finish with the homework, you'll be able to give me a, a one-line proof of this fact. So far, it's a nice proof, but maybe maybe we're missing something. Maybe we haven't really understood. Which is good. That's it's good when you don't understand something. You have to. You have more to learn. Okay. Uh, so that's fun. And I think maybe that's one of the more fun things that we've done in the class, at least as far as I'm concerned. If you ask me, I think the beginning of the class was quite technical. We had to do a lot of proofs with a lot of computations, and we had to get our hands dirty. Uh, and that's just what happens when a, you know when you begin a subject. You have to you have to lay down the groundwork, um, and you realize that that uh, we still have more work to do. Okay, so let me show you something. Let me show you something obvious that we haven't proved. A polytope is the convex hull of its vertices. I think it couldn't be more obvious than that. <laughs> because we've defined polytopes to be convex hulls of something, it must be the vertices. So let's prove that because we haven't. So, but, I, but I should say, there are still many, there are several. Obvious things to prove. And here's one proposition. If P is a polytope, then P is the convex hull of its vertices. saw some of you begin to do this argument already in, in the homework, and we're going to do something similar. We know that P is a polytope, and so it's a convex hull of something, and we would like to show that that something is the set of vertices. Okay? But by now you realize that actually there are several ways of expressing a polytope as a convex hull of things. Right? Because if you take a, a convex hull of things, and then you add vertices that are inside that convex hull, then you're not doing anything to, to the product, okay? And so the first thing that we should do is we should take this set D and throw out everything that's unnecessary. How do we know if something is unnecessary? Well, it's, you're unnecessary if you can be expressed in terms of the other ones. So, if V is such that V is in the convex hull of the other ones, then I don't need it. Is that obvious? It's kind of I would say that it's one of these things. It's an obvious thing that we need to prove. And uh, it's, it's not hard. I mean, you, it, I think this is this is really something that I, I can 
is a good thing to put in the forum. We're going to put it there and we can work it out. It's, it's, a, it's a simple computation. It's, it's nothing deep. But you have to prove it. Okay? Um, but having said that, then basically, instead of having the comics full of B, we should just peel off that guy B. And so what I'm going to do is keep doing this until I, until I cannot do it any longer. So repeat this. So keep. Keep eliminating. So of course, what I want to show is that W is the set of vertices. Suppose that we have a vertex of P and assume that it's not in W. Okay? And that means that it's superfluous. So then we're going to write V as complex combination of things in W. Okay. Because this means that V is in the complex hall of W minus little b. We're going to write this as V equals lambda 1, W1, up to lambda k, WK, where the WIs are W minus b, and the lambda i's are non negative and add up to zero. To one, I'm sorry. Um, but then what do I want to say? Well, I have to think of what it means to be a vertex. If you're a vertex if you maximize some linear function. You maximize some linear function c dot x. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to assume, because, because b is a vertex, I can assume that c dot v equals c0 and that c dot p is less than z0 for all p in the polytube if you're not v. Because v is the only guy that maximizes c dot v. Okay? But then maybe you see already that that gives me a contradiction. <laughs> Because if I take this equation and I take c dot it, then what I get is lambda 1 times c dot w1 plus dot 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 plus lambda k times c dot wk. And then c dot b is c0. And each one of these things is less than c0, so I get c0 times lambda 1 up to lambda k. But this is 1. So I get c0. So you see, it's not terribly difficult, but there is something to do. So that proves that um, all the vertices of p are in this set w. But now I have to do the other direction. This 
So let's take some point in W. Okay? And that means that W is not in the convex hull of capital W minus little w. And I'm going to keep writing the set, so let me give it a name. I'm going to call this W prime. Okay? And then I'm going to say the following thing. I'm going to say W is not in the convex hull of W prime. So what does that mean? It means that you cannot write as a convex combination. In other words, there does not exist a vector t, which is the vector of, of combination, which is greater than or equal to zero, such that W is a linear combination of W prime specified by t. But this is a convex combination, so I need t to be greater than or equal to zero, and I need the t's to add up to one, which I can write as one equals the dot product of the vector of all ones and t. Okay. That's what it means. So this means there does not exist t greater than or equal to zero, such that let me just summarize this into one equation. One w times t equals 1 times t is 1, w times t is okay. w prime. Okay. And to be a little bit more suggestive, let me erase this greater than or equal to 0. Now, if you think about this, what I have here is I'm saying there does not exist a T which satisfies a linear system of equations and is non-negative. Okay. And I guess you all watched the lecture on Farkas Lemma today, and, and you remember that Farkas Lemma exactly tells you how to deal with the situation. When is it true that a system of linear equations does not have a non-negative solution? What Farkas Lemma tells you, <coughs> so here we have to use, do you remember which number? Farkas 1. Is it 1? Anybody think 4? <laughs> Farkas 2. That's what I wrote here anyway. I hope that's true. Let me just look. Farkas 2. Farkas 2 tells you that if this system does not have a solution, then you have a very obvious certificate for that, which is that you have a way of taking a linear combination of the equations so that all the equations now have uh, non-negative coefficients, but the answer has the answer is negative. And just to remind you, because I, 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 get, I get confused with all these symbols, just to remind you, what I'm saying is this. Um, wondering if this system of equations has a non-negative solution. Uh, if you were to solve this, the system of equations, you would see that the solution is not non-negative. But what Farkas Lemma tells you is that you don't need to solve it, you don't need to work very, uh, or not, In other words, what, what the Farkas Lemma tells you is that you have a way of combining these two equations to give you something, to give you one equation that obviously doesn't have non-negative solutions. In this case, you just add these two equations 
get x plus 3y equals minus 2. And that tells you, obviously, the system doesn't have an negative solution. And that's exactly what I'm saying here. I'm saying, if this, if this system doesn't have an negative solution, there's an obvious reason for it, which is some linear combination A. ¿Quieren que prendamos la luz? ¿Les da sueño o está bien? Mejor, ¿no? Sí. Um, ok. Now, if you see actually from the, from the shape, I'm multiplying this A by this thing. Uh, I'm multiplying this A by, by something that has shape 1 and something. So I'm going to take this A and write it as first the first coefficient I'm going to call beta and then the other coefficients I'm going to call minus B. Okay. So A is equal to beta comma minus B. So then when I multiply this out, what do I get? I get beta times 1 minus B times W prime. So beta times 1 minus B times W prime greater than or equal to 0. And beta times 1 minus B times W is less than 0. So again, I'm not doing nothing, anything very deep. I'm just taking this a and say, calling the first coefficient beta, and then the rest, I call it minus b. And then 